I was going to say morning, but I realized I've said that already. Uh, do keep that passage open in front of us. Uh, we're just thinking about Easter. And uh, so last week and this week we're in Mark 14. Uh, Good Friday will be in Mark 15. And Easter Sunday will be in Mark 16. And uh, just trying to make sense of the events of the cross and that first Easter afresh. Uh, why don't we take a moment just to be quiet and let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the joy of gathering, the privilege of gathering. We thank you for the gift of your word. And we ask, Lord, that in your grace and mercy, by your spirit, you would open our hearts and minds to be receptive to your voice. And Lord, help us to respond appropriately to the truth of your word, we ask. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. I wonder if you've ever thought about how much can change in the course of a few days or in the course of a week. Uh, If you just think about global things, you know, war starts unexpectedly and suddenly, and in just a few days, uh, the world can be turned on its head. Uh, The truth is we know that also from our own lives, don't we? We we know that things change quickly, uh, much quicker than we'd often hoped. And so some of us here would have experienced how quickly success turns to failure. Uh, We might have experienced how quickly acceptance turns to rejection, how the ups turn to the downs very quickly. And if truth be told, it seems to me anyway that social media has just exasperated that. Uh, It's just made it happen at an even faster rate and faster level. Uh, And the truth is, as quick as it is to get down because of social media, it's ten times as hard to get back up. Things change at a moment's notice. I wonder if you've noticed how much things have changed since the start of the service. Uh, Theologically, I mean. The the call to worship. Do you you recall the call to worship? Anybody know what the call to worship was? Other than Lee, because he's got it on his piece of paper. Not a rhetorical question? So we started this morning with the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It's commonly known as Palm Sunday. And we did that deliberately because I'll give you three guesses what today is. Today's Palm Sunday. It's the Sunday before Easter. It's the Sunday that starts all the events off that culminate ultimately in the cross and the resurrection. And if you think of the two readings we've had, the first of Palm Sunday, the second of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, suddenly things are very different, very different. Things are changing. We we started with the crowds coming out in their droves, uh, wanting to celebrate the Messiah, wanting to celebrate the King. They took their cloaks off. They cut down palm trees. They, They put their coats over a donkey. And as he came in, they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. They recognized him to be the king. They cried out to him as Messiah. They praised him. They celebrate his arrival. They're thrilled. And and as we stand in the streets of Jerusalem that that Palm Sunday, uh, what we're hearing is we're hearing people sing and hearing people praise and hearing people worship. But in just a few days' time, those streets will be filled with another crowd. And this crowd will be shouting something very different. They won't be shouting, praise the king. They will be shouting, crucify him. Kill him. Put him to death. How quickly things change. How quickly they turn. And as Jesus anticipates what's about to happen on that Friday, we find ourselves on the Thursday at the end of chapter 14. We find that Jesus is distressed, and he's troubled, and he's overwhelmed. That's how he describes himself in this chapter. And the beautiful thing is he he withdraws. He withdraws, he says, to a quiet place to pray. Just for interest's sake, it's the third time that Jesus has done that. 
The third time he faces a major issue in Mark's gospel, and the third time he withdraws to a quiet place just before in order to pray. I I can't help but think there is an important lesson there for us. Our prayer is the means of grace for you and me in the midst of trying and difficult times. We should actually, as we know the trying times are coming, we should actually precede them by getting on our knees and praying. So, so often, if you're anything like me, uh, you wait till the crisis has happened. <laughs> now, Jesus precedes it by going to pray. And as we, as we share in what's happening in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, I want us just to ponder two important realities. The first is something that I, you and I probably don't think about often. First thing I want us to think about is what is your and my greatest threat? What is our greatest threat? If I had to ask you right now, what is your greatest threat? I wonder if you could articulate that. I wonder if you could think about that for a moment. Maybe some of you are thinking health. Maybe some of you are thinking economics. Maybe some of you are thinking death. What is our greatest threat? Well, come with me to Jesus here in the garden. Now, Jesus, as he faces his impending death in just 24 hours, he sees it in all its horror. By the time we get to chapter 14, Jesus has already predicted his death three times. It's not catching him by surprise. This is not new to him. He knows it's coming, and he feels at this moment the full weight of it, deeply distressed, troubled. He sees the enormity of the task at hand, and we're told he is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Uh, One writer says, There is nothing in all the Bible that compares to Jesus' agony and anguish in Gethsemane. Neither the broken heart of Abraham as he prepared to sacrifice his son Isaac, nor David's grief at the death of his son Absalom. This is that moment of agony and anguish. Uh, When Luke, the gospel writer, writes in chapter 22, he speaks of Jesus' sweat falling to the ground like drops of blood. See, I think as we read these verses, we are meant to feel the sorrow and the anguish that Jesus is feeling on his shoulders. See, it's only then that we, we fully understand his cry. Because did you notice the prayer? The prayer is really him crying out to his father. It's begging his father, Father, Daddy, take this cup from me. Do something. Help me. This is my hour of need. I feel the weight of the world literally on my shoulders. Take this cup from me. I don't mean to be petty or trivial at this moment, but, you know, I've got a cup. It's not really, I mean, I've got a cup here. It's not, you, know, you often don't think of cup as a big deal. Uh, of course, that just showed my own ignorance of the Old Testament. See, when we talk about the cup and the cup that Jesus is talking about here, good Jews would have known exactly what he was talking about. He's talking about the cup of God's wrath. Uh, that's the cup they remember in the Passover dinner that they would have just partaken in. Uh, they would have understood that from Jeremiah 25. The wrath of God that comes upon people. Uh, He would have understood wrath to be God's righteous and just response to human sin. He, He would have seen it and understood it as God's punishment on sinners for their rejection and rebellion of God. He understands that sin deserves wrath. And so as Jesus comes to the cross, he he understands that to save you and to save me, he must take God's wrath, God's justice and judgment upon himself. That was his future, the wrath of God. In, In one sense, it's such an understatement to say he was deeply distressed and overwhelmed. I want you to just think about that for a moment. The wrath of God poured out against all the sin of the world. And he knows that is the cup from which he is about to drink. No wonder he says, take this cup from me. No wonder he pleads 
for the cup to be removed. He, he knows that when he drinks it, he will be taking our sin upon his shoulders. He will be taking the weight of our sin and the punishment of our sin upon himself. And, and I'm even sure at this moment he understands that he can't drink it without being separated from his father in some way. For how can he take on the sin of the world and still be in the presence of his father? And it might be that he even anticipates those words that he will say in just a moment. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is overwrought at the thought. See, it's Jesus in the garden that reminds us that God's wrath is very real. Very real. And God's wrath is frightening. It is a frightening thing. You know, I know you've come this morning to be encouraged. Stick with me. But we do need to encourage you with truth today. And one of the truths that we must grapple with is the fact that God deals with sin properly and rightly. That's what it means to say God is wrathful. It's not to say that he's angry. It's not to say that he's having a hissy fit. It's just to say that he deals with sin justly and rightly, and he won't let it get away. And our response to that should be to be fearful. We should be fearful of a God who takes sin seriously. We should be fearful that wrath is a reality. It is a real threat. See, here's the thing. If you and I are not united with Jesus, we will have to drink that cup. The same cup that Jesus had to drink. We will have to face the wrath of God ourselves. We will have to face his righteous and just response to our sin. We will have to face his punishment for our sin. See, those are the options. Either Jesus drinks the cup for us or we drink the cup for ourselves. Now that should terrify us, actually. We mustn't fool ourselves into thinking that God is the sweet, sentimental, heavenly grandfather who will overlook our rejection of him, who will overlook our sin, who will welcome us home and pretend that nothing has happened. Now, our God is a God of holiness. Our God is a God of righteousness. Our God is a God of justice. And he will deal with our sin as it rightly deserves. Some of you at the moment are thinking, you tell them, Luke. Because we, when we think of sin, we, we think of those people out there, don't we? Uh, can I just remind you that to be a sinner isn't to be the naughtiest kid in the class, although you might have been that. It's not to be the worst adult in the community, although you might still be that. No, it's simply to be someone who thinks they know better than God. Uh, someone who thinks they have no need for God, Someone who lives without God and without reference to Him. And the Bible calls that sin, calls those people sinners, and warns us that sinners incur the wrath of God. Our greatest threat is not a virus like COVID. And our greatest threat is not a sickness like cancer, as terrible as those two things are. Our greatest threat is not economic difficulty or life hardship or the circumstances that we are going through, as difficult as they might be. Frankly, our greatest threat is not even death. That is not our greatest threat. Our greatest threat is that one day we will face God. We will stand before God. Our greatest threat is a holy God who deals justly with sinners, who deals rightly with those who reject him. Hebrews chapter 10 reminds us that it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God if we do not love him and trust his son Jesus. And so we must stand at his feet today. We must fall at his feet today. And we must plead that he will remove the cup. 
that he'll take this cup from us. We must plead for mercy. And the good news is, there is mercy. That's why I said, stick with me. He, is, he, he prays, take this cup from me. But that's not the only thing he prays. And so as much as his prayer reveals to us our greatest threat, I think it also reveals to us our greatest treasure. Come back with me to the passage. It's clear as you look at the text that Jesus doesn't want to drink the cup. And you and I must be clear on that. He doesn't want to take it. He begs for the cup to be taken away. The temptation for Jesus is to run away. That is the temptation. And can I just say to you, the freedom to run away is real. He can do that at this point. Yet he didn't. He didn't. Because he understood it was not about him, but his Father. And so as much as he prays, Father, everything is possible, take this cup from you, he also goes on to pray, but not my will, yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. He understood, Jesus, that it wasn't about him or his preferences. He understood it was about his Father's glory, and indeed it was about the good of his people. And as much as he hoped there was another way, he knew if there wasn't, he would drink the cup for us. He would endure the cross for our sake. And so Jesus drank the cup because he pursued God's will not his own. See, it's one thing to say that in prayer he pursues God's will, but I want us to be clear today, it's in obedience that he submits to God's will. See, I'm guessing in less than 24 hours, Jesus was very clear, there is no other way. This cup can't be taken away. There's no other way for him to save sinners than to die on a cross. And so Jesus goes willingly and obediently. He does what the Father asks, even when he doesn't like it, even when it requires the ultimate sacrifice, which is why when they come for him, just a few verses later, they come with clubs and they come with swords and they come with a whole army. They've come out in force and Jesus says, I'm not leading a rebellion. I'm here to do my Father's will. And I will come with you willingly. I will come with you willingly. See, Jesus obeys his Father. Jesus and his sacrifice is our greatest treasure. I hope you know that today. I hope you know that your greatest treasure in all the world for all eternity is Jesus Christ, the one who took your place, the one who died your death, the one who drank your cup. I hope you know that today. I hope you know that he's the one who does for you what you cannot do for yourself. He endures the wrath of God in your place. And so in that sense, as we, as we get to that this Easter, yes, as much as Easter is a warning for so many people, Easter should be a great celebration for the church. It should be a time of great rejoicing, great praise, great worship. It, it should be a time of great thanksgiving for you and for me. You see, if we are trusting Jesus... If we love Jesus as our king, then the good news is he's already taken the wrath. That's done, because that was done on a cross thousands of years ago. Uh, we sing a song, he drank the bitter cup reserved for me. That's done. I thought you'd be a little bit happier at hearing that this morning. Apparently not. See, see we can't as Christians come to Easter. We can't come to knowing what Jesus is going to do on the cross this coming weekend and, and, and treat that as if it's a non-event. We can't come to it neutral. See, either it's the event that must terrify us, terrify us because it reminds us that God takes sin seriously and will deal with it, or, or it's this, the event that we must celebrate. We must rejoice, filled with thanksgiving. It's the event that causes us to, to overflow with thanksgiving. Remember that was the phrase in Colossians, to overflow with thanksgiving, to delight in Jesus, to remember that he is our precious. He is our treasure, to speak to him, to sing to him, to submit to him, to lay our cloaks down before him, to sing his praises in the streets, as it were. In other words, when we understand that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he said he would, well, then we'll remember that this Easter there is a call to be faithful, a call to be faithful to you and me as Christians. Uh, the mark of discipleship for us is not just recognizing Jesus, but following him, 
And following means we walk in faithful obedience to Him and to His Father. Oh, I'm crystal clear we don't drink the cup that Jesus drank. And I'm crystal clear that we don't lay down our life the way that Jesus did on the cross. But remember, we too are called to deny ourselves. We too are called to pick up our cross. We too are called to follow Jesus. And that's what it means for us. When we understand that Jesus is our greatest treasure, we will follow Him lock, stock, and barrel. That means wholehearted for those of you who aren't aware. Of course, that will play itself out, won't it, in different ways. And we saw a little bit of this in Colossians, didn't we? It'll involve kids obeying parents. <laughs> My son's just turned 18. I kept reminding him, that's great news. You're an adult now. You can go to jail for yourself. <laughs> see, see, but it's going to mean children need to obey their parents. Oh, yes, it's going to also mean, isn't it, that parents are not to exasperate their children. It might mean for us in relationships that we will pursue faithfulness in marriage and we will pursue sexual purity before marriage. In every context, it will mean pursuing holiness. It will mean caring for one another. It will mean loving the unlovable. It will mean fighting injustice. It will mean being generous to all. It will be reaching the lost. See, to be faithful to Jesus is to live lives that please Him, to walk in willing and faithful obedience to God, to pursue God's glory even ahead of our own good, to please God, not ourselves, to be able to rightly say, not my will, but yours be done. And I wonder if that is not actually our great test today. Come back with me to the passage. Remember, this is Jesus' greatest hour. This is the hour of his greatest need, he says. He's overwhelmed. He's troubled. He's taken his three friends with him, and he's asked them to keep watch. Keep watch, he says. And having gone a little bit further and poured out his heart to his father, he comes back and he discovers they are sleeping. It might be they had succumbed to the delights of the meal earlier. I'm a bit like that. Mach is full. Are you a bit like that? You know, you have a good meal, I want to go with snooze. And so in one sense, I'm sympathetic to them. It might just be that they were morning people and this is late at night. It seems to be that, that we're, we're quite into the late hours of the evening. Uh, maybe they were just too tired. Maybe they had a busy day fishing and they were exhausted. I don't know. Whatever the reason, in Jesus' hour of need, his closest friends slept. Three times Jesus returned. Three times they were sleeping. Jesus says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Have you noticed how easy it is to agree with the preacher at church on a Sunday? To nod in assent and say, you go Luke, we're with you. 110%. Amen. Preach it, brother. And then we have to walk outside into the world. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> See, we know the struggles of being faithful disciples in the world. We know what it is to be called to pursue God's glory, not our own. But we know, just like the disciples did, we know we do that amidst the temptation to do what's easy and to do what's comfortable and to do what's convenient. Where so often the call of the gospel, the call to follow Jesus, is hard and uncomfortable and inconvenient. Have you noticed that? The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And so discipleship for us today is to keep watch with Jesus, to make sure we stay awake, to be men and women of integrity, of commitment, of perseverance, of making sure that we don't fall asleep at the last hour. And just for the record, I think that's now. I think the time we are living in until Jesus returns is that last hour. We are called to faithfully serve the Savior who drank the cup. 
We are called to stay awake. We are called to faithfully follow Him, especially now. And so I want us today to remember, remember that there is an incredible threat in the world, that one day they will face God. Jesus, in a great act of sacrifice, has meant that we can face that without fear, because He has drunk the cup for us. But what He calls us to do now is to watch to stay awake. And so dear friends, as we go into the Easter week, as we prepare our own hearts and minds for for the holy week that lies before us, can I remind you to live in the shadow of Jesus' prayer. To live knowing, knowing that He has drunk the cup for you. And so will you this week, and every week, will you live for Him as His faithful follower? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Let's pray. A moment just to reflect.